She has been a professor in the communications department at Sacred Heart University for over 20 years. Her course is focused in journalism, where she has also had a career. She's written multiple books in her life, and as you might recognize here, each book reflects on the same topic. Who is this individual? She is Professor Debbie Donowski. On top of being a professor and an author, Donowski is also a recovering food addict. She developed the condition when she was 23 years old. She would constantly consume junk food such as ice cream, potato chips, and burgers. This affected her life both physically and emotionally. We spoke with Professor Donowski and she shared the experience of facing this challenge with us. I was an undergrad at Sacred Heart and then I went on to Syracuse University for my master's and I moved away from home. And when I was away from home, all of a sudden, when there were, wasn't any um, anything to distract me, like family members or situations, it was me and food, and I was just miserable. I was absolutely miserable. And I went in my third semester, I went to the health center where they had free, three free sessions of counseling, and I talked to a counselor at the school, and then we talked about food addiction and then eventually I ended up going away to a treatment center in between just before I graduated in my last semester. I went to a food addiction treatment center in Florida that, that has since closed. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you learn specifically at that center in Florida? I learned that I have a physical and emotional addiction to certain food substances, flour, sugar, caffeine, fats. Some, um, some people are addicted to wheat. But for me, it's it's mostly flour and sugar. And I learned that once I take those things into my system, that I, I start a physical craving much like an alcoholic does. And then it's uncontrollable. I'll just want more and more and more. To find out more about food addiction, we visited the Wellness Center at Sacred Heart University to speak with Jocelyn Novella, who is the counseling director. Well, a food addiction is, so it's not an official diagnosis in the DSM-5. So the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Health Disorders. Um, it's more of terminology that's used um, in kind of a non-diagnostic way for people who have issues similar to other addictions with specific types of food. The process of food addiction affects the brain in a similar manner that drugs and alcohol do. There's a part in the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is also known as the pleasure center. When the nucleus accumbens is active, cells pass an electrical signal to one another. These signals are known as neurotransmitters, and it's how cells communicate with one another. In the case of food addiction, when one eats something, especially sugar or salty, the messenger cell shoots out dopamine transmitters to the receiving cell. This feels good in the brain, and your first reaction is to keep wanting this feeling over and over again. Thus, this leads to craving of the food, and eventually dependence. Food addiction is dangerous physically because you basically of the weight issue. So it's the same kind of dangers of diabetes, type 2 diabetes and all other issues that you have with that much weight, um, joy problems, all that kind of stuff, just an unhealthy kind of way that your body has of processing food. And then mentally and emotionally, um, both of them are, are, have to do with the way that we interact with food based on our emotional state. It took some time for Donowski to emotionally comprehend her situation while in treatment. However, she received guidance that propelled her to move in a positive direction. I would have to say that probably every person who was in that treatment center at that time had a significant impact on my life. Um, there were people there who were food addicts and were in recovery. There were people there when I first got there who were had been there longer than I had and I could see that their you know they were clear their their eyes were clear they weren't depressed they weren't upset and I wanted that I wanted that for myself I wanted that in my life um, of course I wanted to lose weight I mean it was horrible being that heavy but more than that I didn't want to hate myself and I didn't want to be so miserable and so powerless to just stop eating and these people, you know, that were there, whether they worked there or whether they were getting ready to leave the treatment center after six weeks, they had something that I wanted. So every person that I came across there did. The rehab process was very demanding for Donowski, but she had to push through the tough times in order to fight this. It was very, very tough. Um, every day I would get up and I would think, I don't think I can do this. And I wanted to leave from almost the second I got there, I wanted to leave. but. 
Um, my insurance wouldn't have covered it. It was eight, at that point, this was almost 30 years ago, it wouldn't have covered it and it was $800 a day and I didn't have a job. And my father said he wasn't paying for it. So I felt like I was trapped and, and um, I did want to leave every single day. I was afraid of what was going to happen to me, afraid of what, what I was going to learn about myself. Um, and I wanted to run, but I felt like I couldn't run. And that was a good thing. You know, ultimately that was a good thing. It didn't seem like it at the time, but it was a, it was a good thing. And it's very difficult to face yourself and to face the, the parts of yourself that you don't like, but it really makes it, you know, when you can do that. And, and I don't think anybody could do that by themselves. I think that, you know, you need help to do that, but I think it's, it's worth it, but it's very scary while you're going through it. And even though she's been out of rehab for a long time, to this day, Donowski still looks out to make sure that she doesn't go down that path again. Every day that I get up since, I, I think, you know, I have to be careful and know who I am in order to stay in recovery because there's everything out there that tells you just one bite won't hurt or, you know, there's a, there's a, a baking company, uh, Bake Someone You Love is their slogan, you know. We associate in society food with love and... The foods that we associate with love are never, you know, apples or oranges. They're always cookies or cakes or things like that that are filled with sugar. So I have to be on guard every single day and do, you know, I, I follow a food plan. And I have to make sure that I follow it every day, no matter what. One area where Donowski finds a sense of comfort is with animals, especially horses. She had a career with an organization called Horse of Connecticut, which protects disabled horses from being put down. Her work eventually led to her adopting some horses of her own. I think animals have helped me to be a better person. I adopted three horses from Horse of Connecticut. I had no intention of adopting any horses. And there was a pony who, he was a big pony, but he was a pony. and. He had been beaten and starved, and he couldn't seem to get enough food. And he reminded me so much of me when I was in my disease and my food addiction. And um, he had just pretty much, you know, his feet hurt him, and he had just kind of given up. And um, and I saw him, and I knew, you know, I I, I ended up <laughs> adopting him. Um, his name was Cooper, and he lasted for six years with me where um, we had – you know, we had a good life together and I helped him to get his food in order. <laughs> like I help people. And then he came with butterscotch and she had been locked up in a stall for nine months out of the year. And then Bo, a year later, Bo came and, um, and it, he couldn't seem to get comfortable or happy or anything like that where he was. And I decided that I would give him a good home no matter how long that was going to be. I think what animals have taught me is that I don't know what's best for anybody else, you know, and I have to respect who they are, what they can do, and what they're capable of doing. From Sacred Heart University, this is Ryan Dewey and John Flanagan signing off.